Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and uh, have a conversation with you all about what we're doing at Health Hub and things in health healthcare at UCSF in general. I'd, I'd love to, before I get going, kind of get an understanding of like, who you are so we can understand uh, you know, what will be of interest to you. I mean, how many of you are sort of currently practicing in healthcare medicine one way or another? Current practicing? Kind of? <laughs> sort of? OK. Um, and students? Students? OK. What do you guys do? You're just interested in healthcare, is that right? Awesome. Great. Well, thank you. Um, well, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, we, what we're doing at Health Hub and maybe get a little bit of context about myself and the sort of work I do, because obviously if we want to talk a little bit more about health innovation and, and design and you have questions around that, happy to talk about that as well. I, I worked for the last six and a half years at a company called Frog Design, some of you may have heard of. It's, they're renowned for as being the company that uh, designed the first Apple Macintosh computers. So started as a product design studio, uh, but more, you know, the work that is done today is much more around either medical device or experience design, software, services. You know, run the gamut because all those things have blurred together in the past 20 years. And understanding, dealing with that level of complexity is a sort of stuff that we get to work on at Frog, including work with UCSF, which I'll, I'll talk about. So some of the stuff, including creating new uh, designs for, for neonatal MRI machines to, um, to figuring out how do we help people age independently and work on those sorts of things. Those are the sorts of meaty challenges I got to work on uh, at Frog. Uh, you know, example, I mean, if for those of you who are familiar, this is an example of some work that I got to do in uh, rheumatoid arthritis and really thinking broadly around how to create a uh, more end-to-end -end experience. Um, this was a project that we started with uh, uh, actually a pharma company, because um, as you know, the, 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 the medications for this can be um, very expensive and trying to understand not just like how do we how do we get someone medication but how are other ways that we can support the ecosystem is the sort of work that we got to do and all that starts with with um, sort of getting into the lives of all the different people whether it's patients or practitioners or pharmacists like we go deep and learning the context for their work and then use that as the starting point of of understanding how we can architect better products and services and experiences and these are some of the snapshots of some of the stuff that we do. Um, for me, you know, that's not a, an exercise that's, um, that's theoretical or academic. It's all about making stuff and actually bringing it to market. And uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to work with UCSF was to try and figure out um, you know, how we can bring these sorts of innovations into the point of care, because that's really where it matters. Um, I've, I've done some work with UCSF for the last few years, some of it was really inspiring uh, bringing together, as you probably know, UCSF is, is you know, doing incredible work in precision medicine and in public health. And, but how do those two things work together, right? How can we use sort of these new worlds of data science and precision medicine and think about that as we look at things like social determinants, which has been the, the latest rage talking about social determinants of health. Like, how do we actually bring those things together? And at the time, um, in a different uh, White House administration, there was a lot of interest in, in bringing together those worlds of data science and health and the Gates Foundation. And we led a sort of a two-day symposium. So the work we did was trying to architect this uh, uh, this this uh, conversation and and it was really incredible, and a lot of the work I've been doing, where my intro to UCSF with is with um, CDHI, the Center for Digital Health Innovation. Are you guys familiar with with that organization at all? So um, CDHI has been around for about five six years, and it really started when the world was talking about digital health, right? Like how do we actually? There's all this incredible innovation happening in digital health. How can UCSF partner with organizations to do that? And um, that organization has evolved, and they've done incredible work. Um, some of this work that I've been that we worked on, the Smarter Health Initiative, which I'll share. We worked on some some materials for them where they're connecting. Um, AI and algorithm development, um, for example, this woman, Rachel Calicott, who's an incredible resource at UCSF, they're creating new algorithms for, um, for point of care and have partnered with, in this case, GE and Intel and some other companies to try and figure out how to bring that intelligence into the medical devices that they're actually using. 
Um, so thinking through how you actually do that, you know, this stuff is no longer science fiction. It's actually becoming reality. And the work that's happening at UCSF is really on the front lines of pushing that sort of work. But all that stuff doesn't happen just with an academic universe. So CDHI is partnering with a lot of sort of larger firms, whether it's um, GE or Intel or, or Samsung. Um, but what ended up happening was there's, you know, so much that's happening in the startup ecosystem was, it was b becoming very difficult for them to, uh, be able to keep up with in terms of the amount of requests to partner with UCSF, which is part of the genesis for the work we're doing at, at Health Hub, which I'll get into in a little bit. Before I jumped into Health Hub, though, I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of context from sort of my, my view or random thoughts in sort of what's happening in, in health and digital health, which has sort of informed the, the work we're doing at, at Health Hub. Um, and sort of, sort of what my, my passion area has been sort of this, what's coming together in terms of the practice of medicine and data science. And, you know, everyone's talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, but a lot of that is really codifying knowledge that exists within the people who are actually practicing medicine, right? So like AI is nothing more than like making computers be able to bring all that intelligence into uh, the point of care. So it's not just something that, you know, you can get a, a thousand doctors who are actually bringing their, 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 all their experience into specific care scenarios, which is like the work that Rachel's doing at CDHI. Um, but, you know, what's the, the reality today, as I've learned, I worked on a health data sciences company called with a guy who used to run strategy for the CDC and kind of he opened my eyes to sort of how uh, you know, medicine is practiced today and, and some of the, the challenges that we're having. And part of it is like you know, learning that actually people, when they're getting their care, they're only receiving 55% of the time the recommendations for, you know, for a particular thing, right? If they, if they are going in and they might have, um, I was talking to George about uh, uh, my son who actually has asthma and we went into the point of care, like the actual pr pr treatment they should be getting or recommendations that people are getting, like almost half the time they're not getting the full knowledge that they need to be able to actually follow through um, with recommendations. Like that's that's crazy, right? That's almost, and, and almost a third of the time people are getting the wrong recommendations. So these are the sorts of things that, that hopefully um, bringing in things like data science and making the practice of medicine not just qualitative, but quantitative, that there's a lot of promise to that, I believe. The other thing that's really crazy is a statistic I learned is like how long it takes for the sort of work that happens at UCSF to actually come into care. The average is almost 17 years. Right, it's, 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 that's crazy. And a lot of the work that's happening where uh, in academic centers where they might be developing algorithms or digital things that, um, you know, when they publish new papers, a lot of the times they're publishing their code that goes along with that. Well, none of that work is actually being made available into, uh, you know, into the practice of medicine. So challenging, like how do we accelerate that, uh, you know, this medicine so that at the speed of science, things can actually be brought into practice, I think is one of the, the challenges that I find um, um, particularly urgent as well as um, exciting because there are opportunities now to be able to do that. And the other thing is just around the increase in knowledge. Like, it, you know, we all hear about a sort of data overload, but the amount of information that's now just being created in in, through these new digital tools and genomics and all this stuff, it, you know, it, it would double in, in 1950, it would take 50 years. By 2020, every 73 um, days, the amount of knowledge that's being created um, is going to be doubling. So like, to expect doctors or practitioners to be on top of that knowledge is just impossible. There's no way they can. So it's incumbent on us to be creating new systems and tools to allow people to practice medicine. And people who are training to become doctors and practicing medicine, it's going to mean sort of doing things in a very different way. Because these tools, so that they can keep on top of knowledge, are just going to be changing. So I want to switch gears a little bit because as, as you probably may have heard of, you know, the, the amount of, uh, there's a lot of significant investment that's happening in healthcare and digital health right now. And um, 
you know, maybe five years ago, I'd say that there, people were talking about a health bubble, that people were, you know, are, were investing in digital apps and things like that. But things have matured in a quite interesting way. Um, you know, just to date, um, there's been $11.1 .1 billion in, uh, to date and $4.5 billion in funding in this last quarter. I mean, that's, that's, that's very large, and I'll pro show you something that provides some context to it. Um, but what's interesting is it's not just the startup communities who are, who, are, who are getting investment right now. We're seeing companies that were startups three to five years ago, they're maturing. So you're getting a lot of follow-on investment on things that seem to be good ideas and may have been proofs of concepts, but are now becoming much more mainstream. So like what was the frontier is now becoming reality. And we're seeing that in the way things are getting funded right now because we need pretty graphics to show that. Um, you can kind of see sort of how things have evolved just in terms of the dollars and investment in the sorts of deals that are, are happening. And, and this year is, is going to be even more than, than it has, has been uh, in the past couple of years. And of course, where that's happening, San Francisco is the center of this type of investment, right? <laughs> to date, 106 deals focused on companies that are here, $3.1 billion. So, we are the center of a lot of that innovation, and UCSF is in the center of San Francisco. So, you know, there's a lot happening here, and there can be even more, which is why we were thinking, um, you know, the genesis of the work we're doing at Health Hub. So, but one thing, you know, we, we talk a lot about digital health, but I wanted to sort of share with you a couple of examples of, of companies that have come up in the past couple of years. If you look at the way they are presenting themselves, what's missing from the language? Empowering people to heal from depression and burnout, reversing type two diabetes, chronic conditions. What you don't see there is, there's no mention of technology, there's, it's not, there's no digital, right? It's not digital health, it's health. It's, so this, at this point I feel like People are talking about digital health that's almost a framework that no longer means anything because all health is digital. And what this, all of these companies, um, I'll explain to you this one, Verta Health, which is a clinic that um, is digitally enabled. They actually have doctors and are helping patients to reduce type two diabetes by basically having them use lifestyle changes, particularly keto, ketogenic diets as well as coaching um, to get people off their medication, right? Actually reverse it. Um, but it's all happening through um, digital mediation is the way that people are engaging with doctors. Similar to uh, Livongo, which um, started as a diabetes management platform and now is moving to hypertension. They don't have any physical clinics, right? They are, but they do have doctors. So these are becoming providers. like. It's not just um, any more apps or things like full-fledged providers are now how these companies are evolving. Cricket Health is a really interesting example as well. They are uh, focused on kidney care. I mean, probably many of you have seen these dialysis centers that have been around for a long time. But most of those organizations really are just, um, you know, they make money by dialysis. They don't make, they don't help, they're, they're all about sort of, they're, they're, they're engaging with people way too late in the process. There isn't an involvement in helping people before they need dialysis. So companies like Cricket are partnering with nephrologists and becoming the augmentation of care teams so that people can get better care before they're at later stage um, needs for dialysis. Um, and this is an interesting one called Meru Health in the, in the mental health sphere. This is a company actually working with at Health Hub, which is the how mental health is, is changing as well. This is an organization. They work a lot with companies, um, but also with doctors to help prevent, prevent burnout. They have clinicians on staff. Um, people do go use sort of technology as a way to interact, but it's not the only way, right? So for me, this is a, a really um, interesting evolution to see that this, you know, this blur between what was digital health and who are providers is going to change. And it's no longer becoming things that are on the fringe. They're becoming the things that are taking care of um, some of the largest challenges and ways of dealing with chronic conditions. Before I move on, any questions about these? 
Yeah, the question was, uh, is this an outcrop of sort of places who are underserved um, by clinics? And I'd say, um, no, not at all. These are organizations that are working um, in tandem with insurance providers as well as companies like, um, there's a company called Omada Health, which you may have heard of. They're, they have a, thanks, George. Diabetes Prevention Program. <coughs> they're working mostly in urban areas as well as because they're, if, you know, they don't have to be site specific, but um, I'd say no, they're not. They're not sort of just dealing with with um, people who don't have care. They're dealing with, you know, all sorts of organizations. <coughs> um, I mean, these aren't wellness. Perhaps I mean some of them are prevention oriented. In this case, um, but. Verta is in prevention. They're people who've already been diagnosed, right? These are people who have type 2 diabetes, are on meds, um, and how do we help get them off? There's another company called Onduo, which is um, they're a uh, joint venture with, um, um, with uh, Google and uh, Sanofi, and they are doing this as well. They're, they're helping people to both manage their meds and get off their meds. Sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, I think the, the question was around, is funding sort of going into places where there's primarily a profit motive in healthcare to, for investment, right? Um, I'd say, yes, I mean, funders basically are looking for a return on, on investment. That's why many of funders exist. Um, there are impact investors, of course, who are, that's not their only bottom line that they're looking for. Um, that said, I'd say, you know, the healthcare system we have right now is a money extraction machine, right? I mean, there's so much incredible waste going on. It doesn't bother me to see companies who are, who are engaging in profit if the way that they're doing it is by delivering better care at lower costs and keeping people healthier for longer, right? Um, and I see, um, you know, if... if there's just such profound waste that's happening that I, I believe that if these companies are taking risks and are are providing better care, that's great, right? I mean, I, I feel I feel comfortable with people, um, you know, investing in risk to to that end. Sure, I'm, maybe you could just address. Sure. The, and I hate to be negative. Yeah. Are there holes in yeah. treatment because there is no profit? Absolutely. Anything come to mind? I mean, I, I, I can't think of one particular off, off the top of my head. Um, obviously, well, here, I'll give you one that, that I'm actually working with a company right now. I think partially access to care, as we know, is a, is a really difficult thing in places like, like he mentioned, where there, there, are no, there aren't doctors, right? Like, providing that access, I think, is really, really difficult. And I think that's a place that's underfunded right now. Um, also, people... Um, who are on Medicaid and lower you know, populations where they might be getting Medi-Cal or Medicaid but are basically um, underserved communities, there still isn't enough investment in that. It's actually been really interesting. Um, the former head of CMS, Andy Slavitt, um, who's under Obama administration, who's an incredible guy, just actually formed an impact investment fund that's specifically focused on serving um, these underserved populations um, so I think um, you're starting to see more uh, attention being pay played to some of these places that are much more served for public health reasons or for um, access to care. Um, but certainly, there are still our holes. Sorry, go ahead. Could you uh, give an example of how, let's say, like artificial intelligence would be utilized for depression and burnout? Example like that, or some of these other, or, um, or, or how would the yeah. digital health be utilized? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't, artificial intelligence, I think, is a small part of that, and you know, I think it's a buzzword, but in many ways, it's around. So, as I mentioned, basically, kind of using crowd wisdom that people can then deliver better, better care. I'll give an example of Cricket Health because they're. I, I'm, I find them to be very exciting uh, in in that they're going. Kidney care is one of those ex, 
money extraction places, people make it make money when kidneys fail, right? So um, you know that's where all the money is being made. But helping upstream um, in some of the things we're starting to see for value-based care is starting to happen. So for Cricket Health, for example, they've now formed they form care teams around a nephrologist to support it. So they have a nephrologist, and then they have other. Um, nutritionists, um, you know, another another physician, like all the people to help with the lifestyle change things. They might have four or five people who then become taking over the patient experience and basically help in in nutrition, in lifestyle, in in care, and making sure people have their medication. Um, and all those things are enabled through di digital cha digital channels. They also help. One of the big things with um, with people with kidney care is when they do need to go on dialysis, they have a choice to be able to go to a dialysis center or go to have at home dialysis. But people and at home dialysis is a much better experience. Well, now they're providing sort of digitally enabled ways for people to get better care at home, which I think is a trend that's happening in lots of places. So I think some of these things are about providing care coordination and better care teams and allowing people to have more control over their care outside of hospitals and systems like dialysis centers is something you're seeing broadly in these trends. Go ahead. I'm having a hard time with basic terminology here. Sure. Can you give me, give us a, uh, you know, the, the two sentence elevator definition of digital health? Yeah, I mean, I think part of what I'm saying is, I think it's a definition that no longer has any meaning. Um, but I'll say, because, <laughs> Well, we've used it 35 times in this. Uh... I mean, any sort of care that you're getting right now is using um, digital tools, right? Everything from electronic medical records to your thermometer to, to your MRI machines. Digital health, I think, started as something that, you know, came along during the, you know, app world, right? When, how can we create sort of to, new sorts of tools that aren't directly in inside care um, to to augment or create better care, right? So you saw the first generation of digital health um, were were apps that were for really specific things, right? They might have been sometimes for wellness, that they could have been for um, tracking of of symptoms, or you know, if people if they had chronic conditions, they want want to track some of the things. So very um, specific niche uses, but they. They largely were outside of the world of, of, of care delivery. What's happened now is, you know, Fitbits, for example, right? Fitbits, were, where you think of them as wellness, but Fitbit is now trying to transition to becoming a health provider, a health care provider and doing digital health. They're now beginning to create devices that are being used with hospital systems to be able to track everything from, you know, heart irregularities to you know, potential on, you know, diabetes detection. So these tools, but initially they didn't go through FDA regulation or go through the processes to sanction these tools as something that could world, live within the world of healthcare delivery. And that is changing. Um, that's sort of the evolution that, that, that we're seeing in a lot of different ways. The other thing is, is some of these things that, you know, this, as I was saying, what was digital health were things that were just digital tools or platforms. Um, are now becoming much more around uh, tools that are really a way to deliver better services. So that's where I feel a lot of these things that the services and the tools themselves are now becoming, you know, it's becoming much more fluid as to what you would call digital health because, you know, all of them involve people and, and services, but the tools that they might be using are much more around, um, you know, digital tools than they might have been in a traditional medical practice 10 years ago. Does that help? Yes, it sounds like you're describing a, you know, a, a, a conduit for information, you have this body of information with, with, uh, uh, that no one single person or a group of people can fully grasp and you're funneling it through a system that can actually be applied. Well, I'll get into some examples, but I, I think it's more than that. I think, sorry, you're saying that it was, uh, you know, perhaps a, a system of, of, of making sense of data and knowledge and then applying that in care. And I'd say 
that's one application, right? Um, the example of what UCSF is doing with radiology and point of care, and they're creating new tools for visual, you know, basically visual tools for when people are seeing scans, li live scans, they can be basically be able to mu do much better detection of, of errors by using things like artificial intelligence. On the other side, you have something like like um, Livango, which really is a 12-week program that has coaches involved in it. So it's very much connecting people into, uh, into a program. Then they also have things like digital scales and things like that. So there's lifestyle programs that involve people and tools to basically create um, health, health impact. So it really can span a lot of those things. Sorry, one more question, then I'll keep going. Yeah. It's, it, it sounds to me like what the digital uh, health is bringing is, is sort of um, a, a finer sensing and more complete communications and um, maybe better record keeping as opposed to, you know, um, deep blue type analysis. I mean, there's some of that, but it sounds like a lot of this is just, you know, uh, not just just, but a lot more communication and, and being able to record, um, uh, uh, you know, examine things, get a finer a lot, lot, lot more data points, a lot finer um, look at what's going on. And that's really, that, that sounds to me like that's the essence of it. I'd say it's bigger than that. And there are many different use cases. Sorry, he was saying that the, that the um, use cases is uh, around digital health, is around you know, get, getting better information and, and those sorts of nature. I'd say what you're seeing in digital health as will have impacts in a much larger way. One, one way, and I'll give you an example. I don't know if, if you guys have, if you have iPhones. Uh, if you have iPhones, and the la latest version of the iPhone allows you to basically download your, your medical record, right? Like, that might seem like a small thing, but what this is happening is like, you as human are gonna get much, much, much more control of your health data. And what that's gonna do is allow for much, much more of these tools that were once the purview of, of Deep Blue and some of these other things. Um, you know, it's gonna be Dr. You, right? Like you're gonna be able to do a lot of these things that um, were not able to be done before because your data is gonna live with you where right now it's been captured in, in 15 different places, right? Um, so there, all these different things are, are, are I think, are, are gonna be changing. I'll give you some examples of, of companies as, as we go on um, that, are, that are working on some of these really cool things. Um, so I wanted, wanted you to tell a little bit uh, about Health Hub um, and, and why, we, why we started it. Um, basically, last year, in the last year and a half, I was talking with uh, people at CDHI and we're like, how many startup companies, I mean, if, if you know in San Francisco, the number and amazing talent that's creating these new digital health companies is people come here, right? They, they want to be in the Bay Area. This is where innovation happens. And um, UCSF had around 400 different companies try and work with them last year who are these startup companies. And maybe about six of them got in the door, right? I mean, because there was just no bandwidth to be able to figure out how do we actually work with all these, all these companies. Maybe some of them, there was no reason to actually work with them at all, but you know, that, that's a huge funnel that um, basically could not um, be, be, be worked to come. And at UCSF, they're, they're also they're like, all these ways to work with them. You know, innovation is happening in so many different places in this organization, and if you're a company or someone who wants to work with them, like, where do you go, right? It's not easy to figure that out. Right, like which part of the UCSF ecosystem would be the right door for you to go into? Also, um, you may or may not know, but there, there's this whole world. The way these companies start out, they go through what are called incubators or accelerators. These are sort of programs for really, really early companies who are um, uh, basically, you know, if you're two people, they work in an incubator where they might work for 10 to 12 weeks or six months, whatever it is, to go through a program to basically give them the, uh, the knowledge and tools and people to, like, start their companies. But what happens with a lot of these companies after they've, um, they've graduated from these accelerators, they're, it's like, what do we do now? Right? Like they might have a product, they might have some funding, but then they get into this kind of trough of despair where it's like, how do we actually now turn the thing that we created into something real? And there's 
I mean, 30 different organizations that are, are, are doing these. Some of them you might have heard of at C Cedars, Mount Sinai, you know, UT Anderson, or all these different organizations have, have created ways for these digital health startups to, to have homes and to, to get going. Um, you know, I, I talked to the company uh, the other day that's doing incredible things. Um, you know, they've already, um, they have significant financing. They're less than a mile away from UCSF Mission Bay, and they're working with four different academic centers across the country and not UCSF. And I was like, why aren't you working with UCSF? And they're like, they're in my backyard, but they're impossible to work with. I don't know where to go there. Like, who do I talk to to work, to work with someone there? It was much easier for me to work with, you know, Jefferson or some of the other academic institutions. So um, they weren't. I'm like, well, that's, that's ridiculous. We got we to gotta solve that, right? How do we actually use this incredible brain power that exists within UCSF and, and, and make those connections? Um, and that's when about a year ago, uh, my partner and I, a guy named Mark Goldstein, who is a health investor, um, got together and we're like, how do we solve this challenge? Like, what are the ways, what, what could we create that could help connect the dots and bring together all these, this amazing talent in a way that would, uh, that would be, be helpful, right? How do we actually help stimulate this ecosystem in a way that, that will um, be, be useful? And we ended up coming up with this, guy, this concept called, called Health Hub. And really, we talk about saying we connect companies with the people, expertise, and capital to build um, solutions. This is what people are looking for. And I'll, I'll explain what we mean by that. Basically, we are about, we're, in a way, we're kind of matchmakers, but we're also sort of a support mechanism. We help, um, we, we're working with four different sort of types of people, whether company founders and small organizations. And we're not talking about people who are like just a PowerPoint slide and an idea. These are companies that are already of kind of getting, getting off the ground. They might already have some level of a product and they have some funding, but then they need help. And every single company, as you'll see, once they get to that stage, the type of help they need is very, very specific to the type of thing they're trying to build or the type of challenge they're trying to solve. So sourcing the type of people they need, um, you have to have a pretty large network of really talented people to be able to do that. And that's one of the things we're trying to, trying to help. As well as people need investment, right? Like they, they need to find the right type of investor, whether it's an impact investor or someone who really understands the work they're doing. Because these people, they need to be um, you know, involved in a way that uh, is not just around writing checks and people want to be find the right partners to be able to help them grow their business. So, so how do you actually do that? So we kind of wanted to articulate sort of the four different, for these people, what are they actually looking for? So founders are looking for connections. They're looking for capital. They're also looking for patient populations to test what they're doing, right? A lot of these companies, they have something and they might have tested it with 500 people or 30 people or 50 people. And working with organizations like UCSF, they have access potentially to um, larger populations of, of, of patients to be able to test um, and do pilot projects, right? They're, people want to do pilot projects to improve their technology, improve their service in interesting ways. And then there's, you know, People like yourselves who might be later in your career, who might have already done this stuff for 20 years, but you're not a, you know, you don't want to be a startup or founder, but you'd like to be engaged in helping these companies because you have all this expertise. There's a huge, you know, number of people here who are at the top of their game who want to get involved in that way, but there's no way for them to know how to actually do that. Um, and this, that, that exists just for people who are doctors or researchers, as well as people who might be um, you know, mentors or designers like myself, right? That was one of the things I found. There's all these people who are designing things who would love to be able to work on these companies who don't use user experience or you know, human-centered design when they should at the beginning of the process. So we want to help these people. Um, and then investors are looking for like the right, the next best thing, the next big company that's going to really be doing innovative work. So how do we help find them? So you know, we we started Health Hub. We started recruiting some of these people. Here are some examples of some of the people that we're we're starting to work with, and I'll, I'll share with that. You know, they're they're really high quality folks from a lot of different backgrounds. You know, these are some of our founders, and some of these guys are some of the in types of investors that we're working with. Um, people at UCSF. Um, who are, who are advisors and doctors. Um, and uh, 
you know, I, I thought, that, but the value that we're providing in some ways that we've been talking to people is we're becoming like the door into the UCSF ecosystem. So people who want to work with them, we be kind of are, are, are trying to become that hub, that nexus where we can help connect them to the right people so they don't have to waste a lot of time and energy chasing whoever it is to be able to, 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 be able to partner. And that's where the value proposition we're doing for people on the outside, as well as people at UCSF. We're finding, you know, there's so much amazing innovation that's happening within UCSF, and they need to find similarly, like all the people outside of the ecosystem, but connect them in ways that they is, is not easy for them to break out of. So we're 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 trying to do both. Um, and the vision of what we're doing is we're sort of trying to build four different things, and I'll share with them. Some of them is what we call it's just providing what we call navigators. So navigators are people like who really can work with a company and help find, you know, navigate them through to the right people within the organization at UCSF, you know, say they want to do a clinical trial, but they want to find that right um, PI who is a specialist in that one particular area. Finding them is not easy, and it's not just something we can automate with technology. It requires people to understand the system, so we provide that as a service. We also want to create a space so that people like you who are really interested in this sort of stuff and people who are digital health or health entrepreneurs and people who are, you know, in the practice of medicine, like there's no place where some of these companies can work and provide more of a social environment. So we aspire to create, a, we're thinking about more like a clubhouse around the Mission Bay campus um, for that sort of interaction to happen. We have a a platform which I'm going to share with you how it works, and then we're starting to do events both with people in in the healthcare community. We're going to do our first one actually in in December with a guy named Vinod Kosla, who um, is a renowned investor and incredible thought leader. So we're starting to plan events as as well, which we're excited about. Um, so I want to I want to walk you through sort of what it looks like, sort of the process wise of uh, of of how to become part of part of Health Hub, basically, the way we're trying to do it is we get people, we're a private curated network. Um, we are a nonprofit, so basically we provide this as a free service to people. We don't take equity or any of that sort of stuff. And we ask sort of people who want to participate, um, who have a need, we basically ask them to create a brief. And that's a really simple articulation of where they need help and what sort of help do they need. Uh, and I'll show you that. And then basically we match them and then we help them kind of get them going through, through, through the process. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of, um, a little bit behind the scenes and how it's actually been working. So w the Connect platform, we ask people to define who they are. Are they an advisor or are they a company? If there's someone at UCSF, UCSF already has these profiles that we allow them to kind of pull in, so we already know something about them. And then we take them through, uh, you know, some of you might know LinkedIn and some of these processes. Like, we need a lot more depth and understanding to be useful to people. So we ask them to really tell their story about what they're interested in and their skills in a deeper way. And because it's private and curated, like you're not broadcasting this to the world, you're telling this in a way that people might feel more um, open to share share things about themselves than they would if it was just in a completely open forum. So people are filling out a little bit more interest in them, what they're trying to do, what their what type of um, person are they? Are they uh, a principal investigator? Are they someone who's into design, architecture? Like all these different people are the sorts of folks that one may need in in developing these types of ventures. So we ask them to articulate that define their sort of specialties, tell stories about their, their, their own success, like what have they actually done, what have they done external, externally in media, um, you know, and, and really getting a full idea of what, what, they, what they're about. So it's kind of what it looks like when, with some of our folks. Like these are incredibly talented people um, who might not have a forum for, for, for getting connected, right? Christina is doing incredible work in, in psychiatry and helping underserved communities. Jack Jang, who's a really young, M, you know, we're finding a lot of these physician entrepreneurs, people, you know, he's an MBA and an MD, um, so can really help in, in thinking on both sides of how do we create something and what's the medical side of it. And we, we've, uh, we found some great things with him. Also people like Gary who are, you know, luminaries in their field, they've already 
you know, grown companies had a lot of success, but, you know, want to help that next generation. They want to help the younger generation who is doing great things and, and use all their experience in ways that um, help them scale as humans. These people want to give back, uh, and this provides them a forum to actually do that. So we get all these people, we get them in a database, we learn all this stuff about them, but then, then also we're working with these companies. So companies kind of have to go through the same process. They create, create a brief and they kind of tell us what they're looking for, what type of advisor they're looking for. And one of the things that I, I just developed was then figuring out, well, if you want to work in the healthcare environment, like with an organization like UCSF, which could be UCLA as well, for me, I wanted, we needed to articulate what are those pathways for engaging with them so that we could, you know, do you want to create a clinical trial? Are you looking to do a pilot project? Do you want to co-design a new technology with PIs? Like, what are you actually looking to do? We needed to get to that, that um, level of articulation so that we could find the right people and make matches. And th this is something, the work that I've done over the past month and a half, and now we've finally made this, made this live and are starting to match people with this UCSF specific brief. And we're getting all these kind of amazing companies, a company called Rad AI that's doing machine learning for radiologists. Um, Lucid Act is a company that's really helping in workflow automation, which is something you know, badly needed and create, you know, helping with the processes of, of, of care delivery and, and follow-up for care. Company Birdhouse, which is working on autism and supporting parents and, uh, and children and providing better care for autistic children. Um, Halo Neuroscience, um, uh, you know, there, all these different companies are doing really in, incredible stuff. Uh, Pinpoint, which is doing uh, diagnostics and really, really low cost <laughs> detections of, of, of pathogens and so really breakthrough science that, that these folks are working on. Um, so I thought I'd share some of the kind of matches that we've been we've doing just to give you a couple examples. So as I mentioned, there was this guy named Jack Jing, and uh, we, we connected him with a company called, called Heart Genome, which is doing incredible um, screening for vascular diseases. He started as an advisor for them, kind of got into our network, but then um, connected him up with another company called Scanwell, which is doing UTI um, screening at home um, in three minutes. Like, think of that, talk about like what value of digital health can be like. Imagine what that process is like today, and now I actually at home can go do this, take a picture, send it in to a clinic, and know in three minutes whether I have this infection or not. Like that is reducing incredible amount of waste, and it makes it so much easier for patients. So Jack, we connected him, and now he's become the chief medical officer of this, this company. Um, and believe me, we, we just started three months ago, so we, we're really happy when sort of these things are, are, are starting to come together. David Fox, who is an impact investor, who's been um, you know, really just investing in companies that, uh, where he looks for return on impact. Um, we connected him with Birdhouse, and he's becoming an investor in this autism-focused uh, company. We're working with this uh, guy. There's an incredible lab called Neuro3. Um, that's looking at neuro, neuroplasticity and neuro rehab. And we connected to the guy who runs that lab, lab Karnesh Gangli, um, with a company called Halo Neuroscience. They've developed this, these headphones that do neurostimulation that they believe that they've that have been medically proven to help for sports and for training and to, for all these sorts of non-clinical uses, but they believe that their clinical uses um, as well for treating depression and other things. So now they're, they're working with, with, um, with UCSF to figure out like how do we actually do clinical trials to prove the efficacy of these types of these treatments um, in care scenarios. So it's kind of taking that idea of like something that wasn't within care but now making it real care, care or within care delivery. And a guy named James Hong, this is also a spin out of of UCSF called Hollow Surge 3D. These are people who are um, doing augmented reality for visualization of pre-visualization for surgery to help um, surgeons basically provide understand what they were getting into and using augmented reality as, as a way to do that to provide um, better results. And James um, connected with him and now he's becoming an investor. Um, so 
that's what we're working on at Health Hub um, for any of you who sort of fit the criteria of, of wanting to become an advisor or um, find this interesting or want to be part of our events. I'd, I'd encourage you to, 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 go, to go to ucsfhealthhub.com and check us out. If you don't want to be an advisor, but you kind of want to just be part of the events and be, be part of our talks, you can also just join our mailing list. And, uh, and that's what we're up to. So I'll stop there right now and, and answer any questions you might have. Yeah, it's interesting. So she was asking around things. She gave a particular example of her son who's learning a lot on the battlefield uh, or in these sort of care scenarios and wants to figure out how you can make that perhaps become a new standard of care or take these sort of insights that and learnings that, that he may have and translating that into better care delivery. Is that, is that what you mean? You know, this is one form for that, right? Sort of the, the market and creating new companies and it's sort of one mechanism for doing that. I've actually worked a lot with the VA. Um, obviously, they're working with people afterwards. I, for me, the, what you're talking about is a design question, right? A lot of it is like, how do we figure out these processes? How do we develop, you know, gain these sorts of insights and take those insights in a way that can then be shared and, and become new standards of care. Um, I, I think this is partially just a problem of the way things are practiced right now. Like we, um, it's not, this isn't a technology challenge. This is not a company challenge. These are ways of how do we gain insights and, and then creating new standards of care. And this is part of what I was talking about around, it takes 17 years right now, right? Like there's so many different silos of innovation right now that are not connected together. And um, I think that that's something that some of these digital tools can help solve, right? But a lot of those are, are, um, are organizational challenges, right? And I've, um, and I, I've worked with, with companies like UCLA, the VA, who are, we're investing quite a bit of intelligence and funding right now to try and re-architect how they become learning organizations and how they can take those sorts of insights and make them make them new standards. I'm familiar, I don't know if you know Kaiser, but um, Kaiser for a very long time has this um, organization that basically that's just what they do. They're, they provide design services to capture insights and then, then create new standards of care within that organization. Sometimes that's creating new tools, but sometimes it's just here are new processes. So I, I hear that, and for me, I'm like, that's screaming for great, great design intelligence so that people can turn insights into, into real things. But, um, you know, the sort of stuff we're doing is just one one component of that, right? And and part of that, you know, it's it's also just connecting people. Like people, I, I spoke today with this guy who's doing a really interesting spin out called Arc Health, where basically he's trying to um, deliver new services to Indian reservations and prison populations where they don't have enough doctors, right? <laughs> he's come up with an amazing way to actually do that at much lower costs. But these are sorts of things like, like those aren't, um, those. That's not going to be a profit-focused uh, venture, but it's still a venture that will create a lot of a lot of good. Where there will be investors who will want to do that anyway. Sorry, hope that helped answer your question. Um, sorry, go ahead. What's your name? Tom. Hi, Tom. Um, so I yeah, he asked um, on on our sign up um, why we asked like, whether are you a company with uh, with a grant or seed funded idea. So part of the criteria at Health Hub is. We are, we're working with what we call the sophomores, not the freshmen, right? Companies that um, don't have funding or are still at this stage where they're just an idea, um, there are other better resources for them than, than Health Hub. And we, sometimes what we do is people like become waitlisted because we're not the right, and if you wanna do that, there's the Entrepreneurship Center, there's the um, QB3, there's five other resources that are just working with organizations who are just trying to get started. Like there's at UCSF, there's the Catalyst program for organizations that are doing great research. So that's just, it's just not our, it's just not our focus is working with organizations that are that early stage because that's not where we can provide the most value. What about, not, what about companies that have revenue, but have grants or outside funding? Yeah, I mean, that would be fine. 
if, I mean, again, for us, it's not a criteria around money. It's more a criteria for where are you in that process, right? And do you have sort of product? So, you know, we're, we're um, maybe the verbiage is too limiting and we should relook at that. But yeah, for us, that's just a, it's not a, it, it is around the, like, are you advanced enough where you're not just, just to have an idea, but you have something that's been tested? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. What's your name? Hi, one. Yeah. So his question was, as a provider, how can we start incorporating or some of these programs that I, that I mentioned, like Verta Health or Livongo, which have behavior change association with them, where they they might not be the sort they'd be the sort of thing as a physician you want to know are happening, but might not be exactly what you're doing, or Cricket Health, where they're providing services around neur neurology. How do you actually do that? And I, I'd say the this is the thing that's starting right now to become much more. So I'd say a lot of these companies started because it was so hard for them to work with health systems. They basically worked with um, um, self-insured employers, right? Where they could have much more control in, 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 in actually integrating those sorts of things. The data challenges weren't so hard. Um, you know, and there wasn't reimbursement, right? Like uh, there just weren't codes for reimbursement for, for a lot of these treatments. There's a whole new field of um, digital therapeutics that are starting to change that. Um, there's a company called Pair Therapeutics that is just, you know, getting approval for a, um, um, basically a, 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 I think it's a drug rehab program that can be worked on with physicians. There's another one that I know has been um, getting ADHD. So I think some of these things, until they go through this FDA approval process and then can get start to get covered, um, you know, that's the that's the one big challenge. And then the technical challenge of of health systems like Epic and not being able to actually get into the MR. We're starting to see new companies that are really starting to solve that data interoperability um, challenge. Um, the company I mentioned before that's the $42 million of investment that's 0.8 miles from Mission Bay is one of those companies. They're starting to basically create, I know that sounds like jargon to you, data interoperability, but basically what that means is right now um, physicians are spending, when you go to the, talk to them, they're looking at an electronic medical record. And if you want to be a, a an organization or an app or a company that works that, in pulling that data together, you're kind of out of luck. Like there are just so many walls around those systems that it's really impossible to have that work within the workflow of a provider or as well as um, having that data work together. And that's one of the big challenges that still needs to be solved, but there are a lot there. I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that that's going to be something that's in you know, the next three, four years we will see a lot of traction on. So the question was, are, if I, from Human Centered Design, talked to providers before to kind of understand whether they... Um, you know, are interested in these sorts of things and whether they want to use them and, and that sort of stuff, right? Um, I'd say that's almost sometimes a generational question, um, as you probably know. You know, people who are coming out of medical school right now, it's like, well, of course I'm going to use this, right? Like, they, they're, they're designing these systems, many of them, um, and they don't have any have anything. I think the, the main thing that we're that I've seen having designed some of these programs. The one that I showed you before around rheumatoid arthritis, right? Some people have architected these things and they just are, are not cognizant of the fact that just physicians don't have time, right? Like they don't, anything that you do that requires them to look into a different window on their EMR or spend 30 seconds more time, unless you're saving time and making it easier, they just don't get adoption, right? Um, so I think, People who are designing these systems know that. Um, they also know that a lot of providers and nurses and care practitioners have created their own hacks to solve problems that shouldn't exist in the first place, right? I've seen things around, you know, um, went into where note, like just providing um, accessibility for notes in a way so that people can have access to it. Like there's so many challenges that like can actually save time and provide, provide better care. Um, but I'd say to answer your question, it just it just depends right now. Like, but but what's really exciting is starting to see places like I mean, care PCP care like you know One Medical or some of these other folks where like 
these systems are built into the way care is provided and because they have a value incentive associated with it, like they, you know, they want preventive health as part of what they're doing. And I think that's another big challenge. Like unless you are part of an organization where these sorts of tools actually, um, there's an economic incentive for that to work, like they're just not going to get fast adoption. Got it. So the question was really around um, the issue of privacy and data privacy in particular and um, how that issue is being addressed by some of these companies or maybe exploited in some ways and um, what sort of what, how we look at that, right, and what we're doing. You know, to answer around UCSF Health Hub in particular, specifically, we're not really engaged in that in the sense of like we are match.com, right? Though what we, we do vet companies in the sense that Anyone who seems to have an extractive business model or don't seem to have those sorts of values, you know, we're talking to people. So if, if they seem to be sketchy, we're not letting them in. <laughs> Actually, we have had some people who are, you know, we, we haven't let in. But, you know, the companies we're talking to are, are, are very early stage. So I'm not sure um, how much that is germane. Although I would say it's a huge issue. Um, and... Um, I feel it's, you know, in some ways, it's 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 not getting it. You know, I don't think they're going to be necessarily just technology solutions for that. I think one of the trends that um, I, I mentioned before that I'm excited about is is the ability for people to gain their own control over their own data. So those. Because right now that's, I mean, that is part of um, the plan, like that people are supposed to be able to download and gain control of your own data. And, you know, those sorts of control, access controls, I think, become more legislative issues and, and policy issues than, than, than anything else. And I'm really hopeful that those, they'll be treated more. I mean, organizations like 23andMe, for example, you have your genomics data, um, they're, you know, they, they're making deals with Glaxo's client, you know, with the big pharma companies who are using that information in ways that no, I mean, I've interviewed people who are 23andMe users. No one knows that. No one has any idea how their data is being used. I know that about the email from 23andMe, and we're aware that our data was sold to Glaxo client for, um, essentially for purely profit reasons that may or may not have anything to do with medicine. Right. The, and again, that's just one part of this. If you're not involved in that, I, I understand that. But it is certainly, from a consumer's perspective, a health consumer's perspective, a very real and problem. Yep. I, I ask you to check out, there's an organization I'm really interested in. They're called Citizen. Um, and I, with two eyes, um, it's with a guy named uh, Anil Seti, who basically created the um, platform for, which is now Apple's health records, because he's a real, um, incredible enthusiast for ga people gaining control over their health data. He has an incredible story about Citizen is really around allowing that people to gain control over their data and make basically allowing, only allowing people who they say um, they want to give access to it in ways they want to give access control to do that. Um, he, um, so I, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at that because there are comp organizations who um, are really trying to create new tools to allow for people to gain better control over their data. Well, thank you guys all. Thank you very much.